Hello, everybody, and welcome to an updated talk on the diagnosis and management of stroke and TIA. We're going to go into how this is uh, suspected, how it's worked up, the emergent management, and the follow-up management uh, for all of the major types of stroke. Uh, so this is going to be really important. This is commonly tested on all three steps of the USMLE. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. If you haven't, you can also uh, subscribe to my channel. You'll get updates as I put more and more videos up. All right, so the fundamentals of stroke and TIA. About 800,000 people have strokes every year in the U.S., and of those, almost 90% are ischemic, which is due to the lack of blood flow, versus hemorrhagic, which is due to bleeding inside the cranial cavity. Stroke and its cousin, TIA, uh, can present with similar symptoms. The difference is that a TIA is temporary, and it remits usually within minutes. Um, so often before the patient will even present to the ER, they may even tell you that this uh, happened uh, when they come to the clinic. Um, so uh, usually you'll see patients coming in with stroke. Um, the, the symptoms have been present for minutes or hours, um, and, but it's very important that you understand the difference between the two because up to 15% of TIA patients will in fact go on to have a stroke within the next few months and actually the bulk of them will have a stroke within the next two days. The symptoms of a stroke depend on the part of the brain that's being affected. In other words, the artery where the blockage is, and I'm gonna be uh, primarily referring here to ischemic stroke because it's the most common. The common symptoms, uh, most common symptoms include facial drooping, especially with an MCA stroke as we're going to see, uh, one-sided arm or leg weakness, usually it's contralateral we're talking here, uh, and you may have verbal deficits, again, particularly with MCA strokes, and occasionally there may be altered level of consciousness. You cannot, I repeat, cannot distinguish ischemic versus hemorrhagic stroke based on symptoms. And because the management is wildly different, the best initial diagnostic step is to distinguish between the two, which we can only do with a non-contrast CT of the head. So if you have a patient wherein you suspect a stroke, then the best next step, assuming that they're stable, is to get a non-contrast CT of the head looking for a bleed. There are numerous risk factors for a stroke, and uh, the biggest one is hypertension, okay? Hypertension, it's the number one risk factor followed closely by heart disease, and there are a number of other risk factors. Now, the presentation for a stroke or a TIA uh, is going to, again, depend on the location. The most common location for one of these events is the middle cerebral artery. About 50% occur in the MCA. Uh, now, this is going to give facial and upper extremity weakness or numbness um, and or numbness. Um, you can get aphasia, particularly if it's the left MCA, because that tends to be dominant in most people. Um, there can be dysarthria, dysphagia, and a contralateral homonymous hemianopsia. That's a lot of words. So that would look something like this. Okay, where you, you've lost vision in one field and it's the same in both eyes, as opposed to a, uh, a um, bilateral uh, temporal hemianopsia, which would look like this. And this is what we often see in lesions over the optic chiasm, like a pituitary tumor, for instance. Now, an ACA stroke is more lower extremity weakness and numbness. Um, compared to the upper extremity. They can also have urinary incontinence because bladder control is uh, in that region of the brain. They can develop Babinski reflexes, rigidity, and gait apraxia. 
A PCA stroke, because that is in the back of the brain where the visual cortex is, they tend to have more visual symptoms. So they can have a macular sparing homonymous hemianopsia. They can have visual hallucinations. They can have cranial nerve 3 palsy. Uh, and so the common symptoms here are visual in origin. There's another very particular symptom with PCA stroke called prosopagnosia. And that means they have a difficulty distinguishing faces. So that's fairly unique to PCA, but it's not exactly very sensitive. The internal carotid artery, um, usually here, this is very common uh, to present with TIA because this is an area where you get blockage. Uh, and so this can be very similar to an MCA stroke. They can have monocular blindness because remember, this is the origin for all of the uh, all of the cerebral arteries will start uh, with the ICA, MCA, ACA, and so forth. Um, so they can get monocular blindness, particularly because the first branch of the ICA is the ophthalmic artery, which provides uh, circulation to the retina. And so they would have a uh, monocular blindness, and it's going to be uh, ipsilateral. Uh, small vessel or lacunar strokes can be pure motor or pure sensory. These are very small vessels. A lot of times these can be also asymptomatic. Again, here uh, you can see a map of the, uh, of the different areas of the brain that are supplied by the different vessels. I go over this in neuroanatomy. Now, the initial management uh, is, again, um, to stabilize and then to get a non-contrast CT to help you distinguish ischemic versus hemorrhagic. You should also um, get CBC, BMP, EKG, and PTPTT. And I'll show you why those are important in a little bit. Uh, the emergency management, you want to make sure that you stabilize their airway and provide supplemental oxygen. This is a very important here, though, only if they're below 94%. Uh, you do not want to put them above that if they're below that. So you don't want to make them over 94% um, if, if they're not already, uh, because that has been associated with, uh, with reduced survival. Okay, so if they're 91%, sure, fine. Get them up to 94%, no further. If they're 98% now, you can, that's fine. You, it's not like you need to reduce them, um, but you don't want to sat them above 94%. Blood pressure control uh, should be commenced uh, immediately if their systolic blood pressure is over 220 um, then you'll treat hypoglycemia if that's present, and then antipyretics if they're febrile. So this treating hypoglycemia is why we get the BMP, okay? So that's why that is used. And then we're going to admit all these patients to the ICU. Now, if the onset of symptoms was within the last three hours, the best initial treatment is TPA, okay? Now, there are a number of contraindications to TPA, which we'll go over, uh, but that is the best initial treatment for symptoms that have started within the last three hours. Now, if the onset is more than four and a half hours ago, then we do not give TPA. The best treatment is mechanical thrombectomy. Now, if they're between three and four and a half hours, then we go to uh, this decision. Uh, and so typically if they're under 80, if they don't have any previous history of a stroke, they're not on anticoagulants, then we can go up to 4.5 hours. Um, the further workup is going to be to repeat the CT. Usually you'll start to see damage within, uh, well, usually after three days. We're gonna get an EKG, checking them for AFib. We're gonna get an echocardiogram, again, looking for thrombi. We're gonna get a carotid Doppler looking for blockage. And we're going to get a lipid panel looking for the LDL. And we'll go into why that is. Now, the, this, these are the exclusion criteria for TPA. I don't think you need to memorize this, um, but you should uh, be somewhat familiar with the fact that there are contraindications for TPA. Uh, when we discharge them, we're going to send them off with, uh, with uh, 
antiplatelet therapy. So that's going to be aspirin and clopidogrel. And typically they will uh, be on the clopidogrel for three months. Um, they're going to be on intensive statin therapy. Usually we go with atorvastatin. They'll be uh, under blood pressure control, and then we should manage the underlying causes. So this is for discharge. Now, hemorrhagic stroke is a little bit different. It's actually a lot bit different uh, in the management. Um, once you see a hemorrhagic stroke on CT, uh, the very next step is to consult neurosurgery, and they're going to be getting a surgical evacuation. Now, the management uh, will also focus on reducing the systolic blood pressure to below 160 uh, millimeters of mercury. Typically, we use, typically we use nicardipine. Um, and if the patient is on warfarin, we want to uh, administer fresh frozen plasma. Make sure to be vigilant for seizures. Up to 28% of these patients will have seizures, and sometimes it'll, be, it'll progress to epilepsy where they'll have seizures permanently. Um, so you want to institute seizure precautions if you're taking CCS. All right, now, uh, oh, by the way, I should point out, um, the, this exclusion criteria for TPA, this is why we got all those labs. Uh, so with the platelets, that's why we got the CBC. With the INR, that's why we got the PT. Uh, checking for increased PTT, that's why we got the PTT. Um, so that's part of the reason why we got all those labs. Okay, now when we get that echo on discharge, especially for ischemic stroke patients, uh, we want to know if they have atrial fibrillation, okay? Because if they have atrial fibrillation, they're at a very significantly increased risk for stroke, multifold. Um, so we want to manage that. Now, how we manage atrial fibrillation is going to depend very much on their risk factors. And the risk factors are computed using this CHADS2 VASC score, and you've probably heard of this. Um, there's also something called the CHADS2 score. It's a little bit more simplified. It's older. Um, you can use that, but this is probably what your attendings are going to expect you to know. Um, so it is a mnemonic. Um, congestive heart failure symptoms, hypertension, age over 75, diabetes, stroke or TIA history, vascular disease, age 65 to 74, and the sex category of female. You add everything up, it'll give you uh, a, an annual risk for stroke. And if they have more than um, equal to or greater than two points in men or equal to or greater than three points for women, then you will start anticoagulation with, uh, with uh, oral anticoagulants. And it used to be we gave warfarin um, to all patients, but now we'll give these novel oral anticoagulants. And so what we uh, give for them is, uh, there, there are a number of drugs that you can give. Uh, one of them is rivaroxaban, uh, another is apixaban. Uh, they often like to go for these uh, factor 10A inhibitors. And you know the factor 10A inhibitors because they have XA in them. So those are two drugs that you can go for. Uh, note that these drugs are for AFib, but only in AFib that is not caused by a valvular defect. Okay, so that's very important. So I included this here because a lot of stroke patients have AFib, and it's something that we want to get out in front of because, as you can see, if you, you know, let's say you're a 76-year-old man who had a stroke. Well, right there, um, you already have, are, are at four. So you would be right here, and you have a 1 in 25 chance of having a stroke, another stroke in the next year. Now, to mention, if you have hypertension and you already have some sort of vascular disease, um, now you're at 6. So now you're a 1 in 10 chance. So we really, really want to get out in front of this. Um, and so this goes for anyone with AFib, but I included it here because the big thing that we're trying to pre prevent with AFib is, in fact, a stroke. So to recap, strokes present with various neurological defects depending on the region affected. Most are ischemic. The biggest risk factor is hypertension. That could be asked. The best initial diagnostic test is a non-contrast CT. All patients will be admitted to the ICU if they're ischemic and less than three hours from the symptom onset, we give TPA, provided there's no contraindications. If they're more than four and a half hours from onset, we do thrombectomy.
If they're hemorrhagic, it's a neurosurgery consult. Remember to manage any underlying causes. That includes hypertension, hyperlipidemia, which is why we got the lipid panel, and AFib. All ischemic stroke patients will get aspirin and 90 days of clopidogrel. If they are AFib, then we need to consider uh, managing them with, uh, with the uh, direct oral anticoagulants.